neuropsychology postdoctoral fellowship application process. Answers to burning questions and recommendations. This webinar was jointly sponsored by the Association of Neuropsychology Students in Training, its parent organization, the Education Advisory Committee of the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology, and the Association of Postdoctoral Programs in Clinical Neuropsychology, ABSEN. This webinar was developed in response to frequently asked questions about the fellowship application process that were submitted by trainees. We would like to thank you for responding to our call for questions, submissions via listservs. If you would like to submit further questions during the webinar, you can send them to my email and I will read them uh, to the speakers at the end. My name is Octavio Santos. I am a clinical psychology PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and I'm also the National Liaison Officer for ANST. I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speakers. First, we're excited to have Dr. Jennifer Guest join us. Dr. Guest completed her PhD in clinical psychology at Georgia State University. She did her internship at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and her postdoctoral fellowship at Emory University. She's a board certified in clinical neuropsychology through the American Board of Professional Psychology. She specializes in adolescent and adult populations with cognitive impairment epilepsy, acquired brain injuries, neoplasm, and neurodegenerative conditions. Her research interests include assessment of neuropsychological and neuroimaging techniques to better predict post-surgical cognitive outcomes among neurosurgical populations, such as epilepsy, neoplasm, and movement disorders. She's currently the internship director of the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and serves at the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology's Education Advisory Committee. Next, we're pleased to have Dr. Stephen Bowden join us. Dr. Bowden completed his PhD in clinical psychology and internship at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He did his postdoctoral fellowship at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's board certified in clinical neuropsychology through the American Board of Professional Psychology and specializes in pediatric population. His research interests include outcomes following TBI and epilepsy surgery, as well as concussion and post-concussion symptoms. He's the director of the postdoctoral fellowship at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and is also the current president of the Association of Postdoc Postdoctoral Programs in Clinical Neuropsychology. Next, we're glad to have Dr. Robert Collins on this webinar. Dr. Collins completed his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Houston. He did his internship at the Michael DeBakey VA Medical Center in Houston and his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is board certified in clinical neuropsychology through the American Board of Professional Psychology. He specializes in neurodegenerative diseases, epilepsy, and the impact of medical illness on cognition. His research interests include assessment of the diagnostic utility of neuropsychological instruments, self-report measures, and effort in neurological populations. He is the director of the postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the Michael DeBakey VA Medical Center and serves as a member director of the Association of Postdoctoral Programs in Clinical Neuropsychology. Finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Darren Cobia. Dr. Kobia completed his PhD in clinical psychology at St. Louis University. He did his internship at West Virginia University School of Medicine and his postdoctoral fellowships in neuropsychology and neuroscience at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. He's an assistant professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. His research interests include the development and implementation of computational anatomy tools in studying neuropsychiatric diseases, particularly schizophrenia. He specializes in assessment of adults with ADHD, autoimmune disorders, hepatic encephalopathy, TBI, epilepsy, tumors, and psychiatric illness. He serves at the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology's Education Advisory Committee. Although Dr. Kobia will not be joining us during the webinar, we would like to thank him for his contributions. 
Our webinar is structured into five sections. The introduction will describe what a neuropsychology postdoctoral fellowship is, how it differs from internship and what is typically required from applicants. The preparation phase will include advice about how to become a strong applicant and network, as well as provide you with available resources, a description of the types of fellowships, and some considerations to take into account regarding location. The application phase will offer recommendations about how many applications you should submit, what is a good timeline to keep in mind, considerations about programs which are part of the match versus outside of the match, required application materials, and general application tips. The interview phase will cover where the interviews are held, if you are planning a family, how to appropriately ask about family leave or flexibility in work schedule, what to do with sensitive questions and program responses, as well as general advice regarding successful interviewing. Finally, the post-interview phase will be focused on weighing pros and cons of taking a match versus non-match postdoctoral fellowship, how to deal with different offers, variables that may predict successfully obtaining a postdoc, and what to do in case you did not secure a postdoc. Now I would like to invite Dr. Guess to take the lead by introducing our viewers to what a postdoctoral fellowship is and how to better prepare before applying. Thanks, Octavio, and good evening, everybody. Um, as Octavio said, um, I'm an associate professor. I'm in the departments of psychiatry and neurology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences here in Little Rock. Um, I'm training director of this internship, and I'm also a clinical supervisor for interns at the Central Arkansas VA. Um, I'm going to be covering sort of this introduction and preparation phase, um, talking, giving an overview about what a neuropsychology fellowship is, how it differs from internship, and about preparing yourself for fellowship at the doctoral level. Um, this webinar is based upon questions that students like yourself and maybe many of you have posed, what you want to know about, um, about this whole process. We're going to try to demystify it for you a little bit here. Um, so, you know, I'd like to start then by moving into just, you know, the first question that we received was, you know, what's the purpose of the Neuropsychology Postdoctoral Fellowship? And that answer is a, is a short and sweet one. It's to prepare individuals for independent practice and eventual board certification, hopefully, in clinical neuropsychology. It's the final piece of your formal supervised training um, and is the time during which you transition from trainee to independent um, professional. You step out the door and you're on your own. Um, and it's, it's a great time. Um, a lot of folks have asked, you know, how fellowship differs from internship. And I think I get this question every year from my own interns, you know, what can I expect? And my, my first answer is always that it was the fav my absolute favorite part of my training. I loved fellowship. Um, the two primary ways that it differs are that you have increasing um, levels of independence and you also get to increase your level of specialization. Across each stage of professional training from your transition between graduate school, internship, and postdoc, there's an expectation for growth both in your neuropsychology skill um, and your knowledge. And at this final stage, the fellowship supervisors are really expecting increased independence in these areas. And also for you to have a clear understanding when you step into fellowship of what it is you need in this final phase of your training. Um, and as you go through the two years of the fellowship, uh, for most fellowships, you know, you will be giving uh, increasing levels of independence. So by the time you walk out the door, uh, you really are practicing independently. Um, the other way in which fellowship is, is differs from internship and the thing that actually that's on the, thanks Octavio, um, that it differs from um, internship is the level of specialization. On internship, um, you actually are having to cover a wide range of things um, to meet the requirements of, um, a, of an APA uh, accredited internship and also to get the neuropsychology piece covered. Um, when you get onto fellowship, 
you get to spend all of your time in neuropsychology activities doing the things that you love and this is a good time to further specialize. Um, for many people they're you know planning a practice in sort of general neuropsychology but there are many others of us um, who also you know further subspecialize within the field of neuropsychology and fellowships a great time to do that so you get to go a little more in depth you you have broad coverage hopefully leading into fellowship and you continue exposure to new populations on fellowship but then you also get to really explore either through research clinical activities uh, training all of the above you know the areas of specialization that you want to take in terms of the hours that are needed to meet the requirements for fellowship, um, this is a question that was posed that can be answered in a couple of ways. So prior to fellowship, um, in order to have the requirements, the hourly requirements to obtain a fellowship, um, you'll need to check postdoctoral listings for specific information around this, but generally you need to complete a full-time um, 2,080 hour internship, which is what um, all accredited internships are, um, with a formal training component in neuropsychology, um, you know, up to 50%, but um, it can be less. There just needs to be a formal training component in neuropsychology, ide ideally including both clinical and didactic experiences. But it's really important that you check the fellowship listings that you're interested in to find out what they're looking for in terms of those requirements. In order to actually complete the fellowship, you'll need two years of full-time training in neuropsychology or the equivalent um, in order to do that. It's important to remember that you know the most ideal path to specialization is, is not just the number of hours that you get but it's that your program has didactics, um, exposure to other trainees, other clinicians, um, and again you just you want to review the specifics of each fellowship as you're entering in um, and before you apply. So why are neuropsychology fellowships two years instead of just one um, is the next question that was posed. And this is based upon um, the Houston Conference on Education and Training guidelines. Octavia, we're on the next slide. Thanks. And I have a link to this. Um, if you are not familiar with the Houston Conference guidelines, I'm going to be referring to them. We probably all will. This is something you need to become familiar with because this is what guides um, on the doctoral, on the internship, and the fellowship level. This is what guides your training in neuropsychology, and this is what we're following. And during this conference, it was established um, that a two-year postdoctoral fellowship experience would be the final stage in training in neuropsychology. And that's why it is two years. So the next question is, can I get board certified without a fellowship? Um, currently, the three recognized boards in neuropsychology um, require advanced competence in the provision of clinical neuropsychology services. They all require the equivalent of two years of full-time postdoctoral education and training on at least a half-time basis that follow the Houston Conference guidelines. There's flexibility within certain boards for other accommodations, but in general, two-year requirement is, is pretty much the standard. You need to check the requirements for the board to which you're applying, um, but in general, it, yes is the short answer. You need to have uh, a fellowship so you uh, in order to pursue boards. Um, fellowship is also important beyond board certification. Um, it holds great importance for just preparing you to become a strong neuropsychologist and to help you s further specialize. So we're all interested in you know how am I going to get my board but also um, you know you should be thinking about um, what you're going to do to make yourself the strongest clinician you can be when you when you complete your fellowship. So moving on to the preparation phase and again I'm going to be covering preparation phase at the doctoral level. Um, a lot of questions and some of you may be beyond that um, but for those of you that are still there or for um, some of you who maybe have not entered graduate school yet, um, you know, what are some things that you can do to make yourself a strong applicant uh, while you're still in school? Um, I have links here uh, to a couple of very helpful articles um, that are got, they're focused on internship, but it's great advice to guide 
training and goal setting during your doctorate as well. Um, but the first thing, and I'm going to come back to it, is become very familiar with the Houston guidelines. This is the best source of information for what is actually required. And um, if you can become familiar with that, make sure you're meeting those requirements, then you're, you're on the right road uh, to making yourself a very strong applicant. I think a lot of people will ask me before they enter graduate school, um, should I pursue a PhD or a PsyD? In data gathered by Absin, um, it was found that students were much more likely, almost twice as likely, to match uh, for fellowship with a PhD as opposed to a PsyD. Now, this is not to say that PsyDs can't be very strong. It's only one indicator, but it seems to be correlated with things like research experience, academic productivity, working with well-known mentors in the field, and these things can um, be important factors uh, you know, on their own as well, regardless of the type of degree. I think that it's important when you're choosing which type of degree you want to pursue to also think about your long-term goals for your career. Um, which, you know, what is it that you're wanting to wanting to do? What are you wanting to specialize in? Are you planning to have research as a large part of your career? If so, you may want to pursue a PhD. Um, again, just factor in those decisions when you're, when you're choosing which degree to go after. And I know it's a complicated decision, and I knew very little when I was entering my first graduate program and asked that this exact question, not knowing at all you know, what the differences were. So um, get a lot of advice from a lot of people, but think about what your long-term career goals are going to be. And do remember that um, you know, just in, in terms of the data that we have, in terms of match rates, Folks with PhDs tend to do a bit better um, in terms of matching, but the factors that are related to that are research experience, academic productivity, and again, working with well-known mentors. So you can do all of that with a PsyD as well. Um, I don't want to dishearten those of you that are that are working on your PsyD right now. Um, just make sure that you're including all of all of these things um, at the same time. So, do my supervisors need to be board certified? I think in general, having um, board certified supervisors is really ideal, and it is favorable. When fellowships um, are reviewing applications, they look to see if you've been supervised by somebody who's board certified. Um, but I think equally important is your diversity of supervision. So if you have one board certified supervisor, and that is the only individual with whom you work um, throughout your training, uh, versus somebody who has a number of, of you know, excellent supervisors who are not board certified in a range of clinical settings, that's going to be tough. I mean, that diversity of training is equally important. So while it's great to have board certified um, supervisors, and you should certainly seek that out, um, you also want to make sure that you are training in a, in a wide range of locations. And not every single one of your training supervisors needs to be board certified. Um, what sort of coursework should I obtain? Uh, again, referring you back to the Houston guidelines. Um, it really varies. Uh, it's really important to look at the requirements for specific sites. Some may actually list specific courses that they want you to have for you to apply for the fellowship. Um, and again, if you're, if you're looking at the Houston guidelines and following those guidelines, um, that should help you to understand the type of coursework that uh, fellowships are going to be looking for uh, in their fellows, things that you've completed. Uh, I think what's very important around the coursework issue is to be very clear in the letters, in your applications that you're writing for fellowship to explain what your coursework is. Courses are titled all kinds of different things among different institutions, and sometimes when folks are, you know, reviewing transcripts, it's very hard to determine what the courses are that you've actually had based on the course title alone. So in your cover letter, and the cover letter is extremely important, I'm sure um, that you'll hear more about that. Um, in your cover letter, describe the coursework that you've had, describe the training that you've had so that the folks that are reviewing it will understand that yes, you've had a course in neuroanatomy and yes, you've had, and you know, again, refer to the Houston guidelines, but demonstrate for them and just lay it out in the cover letter exactly um, the nature and the extent of, of the coursework that you've had. 
So in terms of research, how many posters and publications should I seek to complete and is first authorship important? Well, the cold hard truth is the more the better. Um, it does depend on site and it does depend um, on the focus of the fellowship that you're applying to. But um, generally, the more productive that you show that you can be um, academically, the more attractive that you're, you're going to be. Um, it's also very important that you have some first authorship because that really indicates that you're someone who's able to take charge of a project as opposed to having multiple low authorship. So having fewer, a, f a smaller number, but first authorship is going to carry more weight than a larger number when you're way down on the authorship list. Those are good too, but um, definitely make sure you have some where you've taken the lead. The top sites, the top fellowship sites are um, becoming increasingly competitive in this regard. So, you know, really work hard to get some get some things published, get some posters out, get some, some papers out. Um, and this is going to be most important for the fellowship sites that have dedicated research components to the training. So, you know, look at the fellowship sites to which you're applying um, and, uh, and, you know, if you are somebody who has not done a whole lot of research and uh, is not interested in pursuing research, as a career, those may not be sites that you know you want to go after. But for those of you that are that are aiming for um, more academically oriented um, fellowships, um, more academically oriented careers, you you know really uh, work hard and get those those papers and pu um, posters done. So, what's the what amount and type of clinical training is best at the doctoral level? Again, this depends on your goals, um, but it's best to have experience in the settings for which um, you're seeking internships, uh, fellowships, et cetera. You know, in general, um, academic medical settings, VAs, um, these usually have great uh, experiences. If you can get um, didactic training, uh, practicum training there, um, that's fantastic and usually are, are weighed a little more heavily than, uh, you know, than an independent private practice might be. Now that's not an option for everybody, but if you can get those opportunities, please do. And I think it's also very important that you distinguish um, during your clinical training uh, whether you just did test administration um, or if you did report writing. I mean, the types of experiences that you get in these settings is just as important as where you do them. Um, so somebody who has, you know, thousands of hours doing test administration and only test administration and has never written um, a fully integrated report or been involved in that part of the process um, may not be, even though they have a lot of hours, may not be looked upon quite as favorably as somebody who has fewer hours but has done more integrated report writing and been involved in a, in a slightly higher level. Um, in the uh, in the clinical work, um, a diversity of experiences again is very desirable, and that includes you know working with different patient populations, working in different types of settings, inpatient versus outpatient, working with other departments, other disciplines, treatment teams. The the you know the greater diversity you can have in terms of your clinical experiences, you know the better you will be off when you apply. And finally, you know, how important are the professional activities? You're, you're so busy doing everything else. Um, what about the professional activities? You know, what counts here? This is probably l less important than the other. It's, it's not essential, but it can be very helpful in extending your own network. Involvement with organizations like ANST, um, uh, participation in scientific conferences, this is a great way to network and everybody hears about networking but I cannot emphasize it enough. This allows you to become familiar with your peers, it allows you to meet training directors, researchers, leaders in the field and other individuals who when you go to apply later may remember your name um, and know you and they've worked with you and you know that's important and, and they know how good your work is. So getting involved on that level can really be beneficial to you. Is it something that is um, that is going to be weighed as highly when uh, fellowship directors are looking at your application as your clinical experiences or your own research? Probably not, but if you can do it it's really you know nice icing on the cake there. And I think that's it for me.
Well, I think I'm up. Uh, my name is Rob Collins, and I'm a neuropsychologist here in uh, Houston, Texas, at the Houston VA. And Octavia, thank you for uh, putting this together. And uh, good evening to everybody else out there on the webinar. Uh, appreciate your attendance. Uh, so basically, I'm going to be speaking about uh, things that occur at the internship level, uh, considerations when applying to internship, and then some postdoctoral issues as well. Next slide, please. Um, a, really, a, a, a primary question that lots of folks have uh, when applying to internship is, should the internship program be accredited by the APA? And how might this be viewed by postdoctoral fellowships? This is a very important uh, question that you have to give serious consideration to. Everybody appreciates that uh, there is uh, an internship uh, imbalance uh, with a overall shortage of slots. Um, we're aware of that. Uh, but as a training director, as somebody in the field, um, Choosing not to do uh, an APA internship will have, you know, significant consequences. It will um, likely significantly limit your fellowship opportunities to begin with. But it's not just that. There are uh, downstream licensure uh, consequences where it will be very, uh, it will be more difficult to become licensed in certain states. There's no doubt about that. There are implications for board certification, uh, as in not being eligible for board certification. And there are employment uh, uh, implications as well. So for example, uh, in the VA, if you uh, uh, want to be considered for employment, if you attended an internship outside the VA that's not accredited, uh, you uh, are probably going to be prohibited from applying. That's a big deal because uh, the VA employs more psychologists, neuropsychologists than uh, any other uh, uh, organization in the United States. So the recommendation is clearly uh, to uh, pursue an APA accredited internship and if not, really uh, uh, give consideration to the long-term implications and what that's possibly going to mean. Okay, there we go. Um, a question, I was unable to obtain an APA accredited internship and instead obtained a KPIC internship. So the same, uh, the same issues apply uh, as did uh, on the previous slide. Uh, it will be obviously uh, easier to get licensed with a KPIC internship in the state of California. Uh, and you will not have as many limitations, but uh, in terms of uh, postdoctoral fellowships in neuropsychology, uh, there will be limitations, there will be restrictions, um, and you will, uh, you know, there are, there are limitations in terms of the no total number of programs that you're going to apply to. And in a system which is limited and, and quite competitive, um, that is uh, going to create a little bit of a burden, I'm quite sure. Um, so again, the accreditation issue is important and just uh, give uh, consideration to it. Okay, do my internship supervisors need to be board certified? And I would um, certainly echo Dr. Guess's comments about uh, if, it is, if, if, if the opportunity presents itself to work with a board certified uh, supervisor, you should probably take advantage of that. Uh, but the diversity of training that a tr uh, that uh, an intern can have is also uh, just as important. Uh, in reality, across most internship uh, sites, there are only going to be uh, so many uh, psychologists there that are going to be board certified. Um, and uh, amongst the neuropsychologists, if you're fortunate, there, there could be a couple, but you should strive to work with as many as you can and get as many different training experiences as you can. But um, you should also try to work uh, with some board certified folks. And, and training directors at the, at the fellowship level, they appreciate both diversity of experiences, but also uh, appreciate receiving letters uh, from board certified neuropsychologists that can really speak to the strengths of an applicant. So what sort of neuropsychology didactics should I obtain? 
Um, again, um, you should use the Houston Conference Guidelines as, um, as a reference here. Uh, in many ways, this question is going to be dictated by the internship uh, site. And if you're fortunate enough to uh, obtain a neuropsychology track internship site, which is desirable, uh, in all likelihood there are going to be a core set of didactics that they will have set up for the neuropsychology trainee. Um, if you are attending a site where they don't have a formal track but they have uh, a concentration in neuropsychology, uh, you sh there will be didactics that will be offered um, and you should try to get additional uh, didactics um, uh, if they're available if there are some case conferences or if there's a neurology department, if they have uh, their own uh, didactic series or grand rounds, you could sit in on a couple. Uh, but ultimately, you want to use the Houston Conference Guidelines um, as a reference here. You need to find out where your areas of weakness are, and then you need to work to improve those areas. Um, and that goes uh, across both knowledge and skill um, is what is addressed in the Houston Conference Guidelines. So. Um, some of this will be determined by site, but uh, uh, you should get as much as you can. So, research. Uh, research at the internship level uh, is different than research at the graduate level, and it's different than research at the postdoc level. And the primary reason that it's different is you only have a year. When you are an internship, it's a very, very busy period of time. And it's, um, it's, uh, it would be difficult for uh, an intern to walk into training and then to create a, a walk to the internship day on day one and, and then to create a, a, a new project and then to see that project to fruition um, in the period of one year and everything that goes along with that with IRB and, and everything else. Um, in addition to all of the other clinical and didactic responsibilities that you're going to have going on that particular year. Whereas while you're at graduate school, there's a longer period of time, and, and during fellowship, there's also a longer period of time. Uh, with that being said, if there are research opportunities at the internship site, you should take advantage. This will be looked uh, uh, upon uh, favorably by uh, training directors for when you apply to uh, fellowship. Um, in my opinion, I think uh, maybe uh, getting a poster out of uh, internship is a reasonable expectation. A publication would be fantastic. Um, and the order of authorship does matter, as uh, Dr. Guess has indicated, and certainly shows uh, for senior authors a, a, a sense of uh, commitment and responsibility to, to a project. Um, Research is important, though, at all levels, uh, and the Houston Conference Guidelines are very specific about uh, wanting uh, producers and consumers of research. Um, but again, some of it will be determined by the site. Uh, in terms of tailoring your research to your uh, uh, fellowship site, uh, that's difficult. It depends on the applicant. Some applicants uh, come from programs and they have a trajectory already early on, whereas uh, some applicants are moving through graduate school and then internship and then are uh, sort of refining their research interests as they go along. Uh, but if you are a person that has a trajectory early on and you know what you want to do, then you probably need to find a fellowship that's going to uh, take you in the right direction. Um, okay. At the internship level, um, the big question is, uh, do I need to have 50% neuropsychology? And this is the question that's uh, existed for a long time. It existed when I was applying to internships uh, many, many years ago as well. And uh, it turns out that currently there's no set guidelines on having to have a 50% neuropsychology internship. Uh, in the first issue of Clinical Neuropsychologist, there is a position paper that indicates that you should have 50 percent. 50 percent was adopted uh, later on by INS as a training guideline. But eventually all of this was superseded by the Houston Conference Guidelines, 
And what this suggests is that you get varying levels of neuropsychology uh, experience uh, or very de various degrees of experience at different levels, at the graduate level, the intern level, and the postdoc level. And while you're expected to have those experiences at every level, the amount that you need will vary by person and by level. Uh, with that being said, as a fellowship director, most fellowship directors like to see folks that are coming from neuropsychology tracks, and that would be probably at least 50%. Um, some programs, internship programs, have concentrations which will approach 50%, and that's good. Uh, but ultimately, you need to get as much neuropsychology at the internship level as you can, and you need to balance that against what you already have in terms of experience at the uh, graduate level. And if you are pure neuro at the graduate level, it may be time to increase your uh, therapy and um, other, uh, other skills at the internship level and maybe dial it down uh, a little bit. So, um, but the take-home question, there's no real 50% rule, but obviously you, you need to have a concentration in uh, neuropsychology. Uh, professional activities, are they important? Uh, well, they are important. Um, you know, relative to some other activities like research and, and get, getting good neuro experiences, uh, obviously not as important, but it is important to your professional development and your identification of your future identity as a, uh, as a neuropsychologist. Uh, I like to tell uh, all the trainees at different levels that you need to wear the vestments of your profession, and part of that is uh, being involved in organizations and in various uh, professional activities when they present themselves. Um, they're great networking opportunities and the training directors for the programs that you will ultimately apply to, they will appreciate this. Um, so uh, take advantage of it when you can. So for interns, for current interns, uh, folks that are already at the internship level, and the next series of questions will sort of assume this, uh, these questions about have to do with uh, moving to the fellowship level. So the first one is where can I find out about fellowship opportunities? And obviously, uh, you know, obvious uh, answer to this is through networking, through uh, groups like uh, ANST, uh, who was uh, gracious enough to host this conference, <laughs> this webinar, uh, professional conferences like uh, NAN and INS, uh, professional listservs are available and uh, in terms of a fellowship specific thing that I, that I like to happen is I like when uh, trainees who are on internship reach out to me as a fellowship di director to inquire about the program and to uh, have questions which are informed questions where they've uh, done their homework. Uh, but that's a nice personal touch and um, I believe that most training di directors really do appreciate that. Uh, other resources exist for uh, finding out about fellowship opportunities. APA has a list of specialty accredited fellowship programs in neuropsychology. Uh, APPCN has a list of uh, APPCN member programs. And then APIC uh, keeps a list of programs not necessarily uh, uh, as members of APPCN, but that also have neuropsychology fellowship opportunities. Uh, in partner with APPC and NMS, we'll also have a list of uh, neuropsychology uh, fellowship sites that are participating in the match. Uh, conferences are also a good place to uh, seek out uh, fellowship opportunities. Uh, INS frequently has a, a message board where you can find out about fellowships that are not part, uh, uh, participants in the match but still have uh, fellowship opportunities. At the internship level, do neuropsychology fellowships have to be accredited by the APA? And so the next really series of questions have to do with what is the difference between APA accreditation, what is APPCN, uh, do these things, uh, are they required? So APA does uh, accredit some fellowships, um, and unlike most 
internships which are accredited by the APA. Very few fellowships are accredited by the APA. In fact, most of the neuropsychology, neuropsychology fellowships are not APA accredited. Um, here at the Houston VA, we are APA accredited, and I can speak to the experience here and what I think it means. But I do want to make it clear that you don't have to attend a, an accredited fellowship uh, in order to become board certified in the future. What I will tell you about the programs that are APA accredited is that they've uh, undergone a pretty rigorous process which evaluates their training mechanisms. Um, and these programs have to provide outcome data. And the best way that I can describe it uh, to people who are interested in coming here is that we're accountable. So I believe that accredited programs have to provide, have to be accountable. If you say that you're going to produce a board certified neuropsychologist, for example, a goal that we have, then ultimately we are judged by our ability to produce those uh, types of uh, neuropsychologists. Um, and there's a higher degree, there's a high, not a higher, but a high degree of organization which is just essentially vetted uh, by uh, AP, an outside organization, the APA. Um, but again, it's not a requirement for board certification and most fellowships are not APA accredited. So, what does it mean if a program is an APPCN member? Uh, APPCN, again, Association of Postdoctoral Programs in Clinical Neuropsychology. Uh, there are many, many APC, APPCN programs. There are 66 member programs. Um, some of these programs are specialty accredited by the APA. Some are not. Um, the member programs that join APSEN have made a commitment to provide training which is uh, consistent with the Houston Conference guidelines and they've made a commitment to provide training which will prepare, uh, prepare uh, uh, fellows for board certification through ABPP. Um, amongst other requirements, uh, absent programs uh, agree to provide supervision, uh, a set amount of didactics and a set amount of research opportunities. Uh, to all fellows. Um, there are advantages to attending an absent program and this also applies to an APA accredited program is that all trainees are allowed to fast track their materials to uh, uh, ABPP for application purposes and it streamlines the application process um, and it, in, in the way that the uh, didactics and the research and the supervision that doesn't have to be vetted to the degree uh, that it will if you're not coming from an absent or an APA specialty accredited program. Um, and again, attending an APA accredited fellowship or an absent fellowship is not a requirement for board certification. What about attending a fellowship that is not an absent member program or an APA accredited program? So the theme here uh, across these slides is moving from uh, very centralized and regulated training to less and less of a regulated training process. And many, many uh, folks are, over the years have attended fellowship programs like this. They're not absent members. They're solid programs. But I think you have to do your homework. Um, I think the questions that I would ask is I would want to know has the program been established for a long time? Have they been successful in producing board certified neuropsychologists? Where are their graduates working? Are their graduates working in a place that is similar with the uh, career trajectory that I envision for myself? Um, do I that way do I know I'm going to be able to get there? Have other people also been successful? Um, I would have, and I think that you should have, if you're considering a program like this, um, uh, questions about the didactics. Um, are the didactics well organized? Are they planned out in advance? Are they even offered? Who's in charge of providing those didactics? Um, didactics are important. Um, I, I know that uh, some folks could view a fellowship as just a sort of a junior colleague, but a fellowship is a training period and that training period has to 
have a development of both skill in neuropsychology and knowledge. And this comes both from clinical activity, but also set and organized didactics. Um, if you are attending a fellowship like this, uh, then uh, you have to do, uh, it's probably going to require more work in terms of your application for board certification. Um, and I think you need to do your homework. Um, you know, you can still become board certified, obviously, attending a, a fellowship like this, but ultimately, you need to think about the quality of your training and make sure that this is going to get you to where you want to go. And then what about creating my own fellowship or doing a fellowship in private practice? So this would be the least regulated of all uh, the uh, possibilities. And uh, there are lots of folks that do this. I've known folks that have done this. Um, and I would say the preceding rules apply, uh, the preceding rules from the previous slide. I would ask the same questions. Uh, have they done this before? Have they been successful in producing board certified neuropsychologists? And where are their graduates working? How am I going to get my didactics? Um, how, who, who's going to provide these? You still have to have didactics at this level. And again, at this, for a fellowship opportunity like this, it will require more work uh, for your application for board certification because you are going to have to document your didactics. You're going to have to indicate that you've had your appropriate supervision, that you've had the appropriate amount of uh, clinical hours, that you are really working as a trainee. Uh, this is another tricky issue. You still have to be identified as a fellow and not a and not a psychologist because you're still in a, in a training position. And you do need to do your homework, uh, particularly on this one. Okay, so if you are a fortunate uh, trainee, you secure a internship, a neuropsychology internship, and you happen to be at a site uh, that, actually, that has a neuropsychology fellowship, now, what are the pros and cons of staying on for fellowship? Uh, well, there are a lot of pros, I think, right? So lots of sites uh, like to recruit from their internship class. Um, uh, for them, you're uh, essentially a known quantity. You uh, go there, you hit the ground running, and you're an outstanding intern. They recognize the outstanding work that you do, and they may not want to part ways with you, and that's a good thing. And as an intern, as a budding professional, it's nice to be appreciated that way, certainly. But you have to give some consideration uh, uh, to some other things as well. How is your training experience going to be different? Are you doing the same thing, or is it just going to turn into a three-year internship process? Are the didactics different? Uh, ideally, the didactics should be um, uh, at a level which is more appropriate for a postdoctoral fellow rather than an intern. It should be more complex. There should be more requirements placed upon you. And ultimately, what I would say is you need to ask yourself, how does this affect your professional development as a neuropsychologist? Um, I believe there's a real value into working with uh, a lot of different neuropsychologists that have different perspectives about different things, and you will, uh, over time, create your own identity, and it'll be a an amalgam of all of those uh, wonderful folks that you've had an opportunity to work with. And if you limit those opportunities by just staying on a one site, then there is a, there's a consequence to that. You know, it won't be a horrible consequence per se, but it does have, you know, it does have a consequence. And you want to be, and we want you to be the best neuropsychologist possible. Tricky question. How much should I consider location. Uh, should I try to do a fellowship or expect to settle down? So these are questions that come up every single year amongst trainees. Um, I don't want to speak for Dr. Guess or Dr. Bowden, but this particular question came up for myself and I can certainly appreciate um, the pressures that uh, uh, that interns and have when, 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 when considering a fellowship and what are the implications about moving and whether to move or not. 
Obviously, if you decide that you have to restrict yourself geographically, you will limit your chances of obtaining a fellowship. Um, and so, but all of the folks that limit themselves, they're aware of that, and they, they keep that in mind uh, going into it. As a director of a fellowship program, what I want um, is for uh, you to become the best neuropsychologist possible, and I want you to seek out the very, very best training uh, possible. Uh, this is no different than our colleagues in medicine or other fields would do. Uh, you travel to get the best training to become the best uh, specialist in your particular field um, that you can. And that comes at a cost sometimes. And again, I do understand and certainly appreciate there are uh, competing pressures uh, uh, that everybody has. Uh, but ultimately, you are seeking to be a specialist in, in a field which is not an easy field. It's a, it's a field that requires a lot of training and uh, more so than uh, a lot of other areas in psychology in general. And we want uh, proficiency and competence and you need to get the best training possible. So that doesn't really answer the question. Um, but it is a complex question. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Doug Bowden. Um, I'm currently um, at Nationwide Children's Hospital and uh, the Ohio State University, and I'm uh, president of uh, APPC. And um, I also want to thank. Um, Octavio and Anst for organizing this conference and I uh, thank all of you for attending. What I'm going to focus on is the um, nuts and bolts of uh, the application phase for postdoc um, as well as talk about uh, the interview phase and then uh, what happens uh, following the interview. So these are some questions that were submitted. Uh, uh, these first two slides are sort of related. So is there a suggested number of applications I should submit in order to maximize my chances of receiving an offer or being matched? There's no real magic number. Um, past match data has suggested that uh, matched applicants uh, rank on average almost six programs and unmatched applicants uh, rank on average three or four programs. So you can conclude from that there is um, a relationship between the number of programs that you rank and your probability of getting matched. But really fit is more important So when, when you're thinking of programs. You don't want to apply to every program out there. It needs to be programs that you that you fit with. So the next slide is uh, related to that. So how many applications are too few or too many? And again, there's not really a magic number. It really depends on your circumstances. As uh, Dr. Collins mentioned, many people are have geographic restrictions. You may have a, a partner or a spouse who is unable to move uh, because of their job and so you may be limited to a certain region of the country which obviously is going to affect the number of programs you can apply to. And in these cases you really want to seek out advice from your mentors um, and I can't stress that enough that it's very important that you have either a mentor from graduate school or someone you're working with on internship who can really understand what your circumstances are to help uh, you answer these questions for yourself. If you're not restricted geographically, I usually tell people to shoot for five to ten programs um, that, that you're going to apply for. So what is a reasonable timeline for me to start the process of applying for fellowship? Um, the short answer to that is that uh, this is go time right now for you guys, um, at least for those of you that are applying for postdocs. So many of the announcements for postdoc positions have come out in the last two to three weeks on the various listservs. And the application deadlines tend to be in December to sometime in January. So right now, November is, is the big month. So right now, you, you're, you're looking at programs and you're 
hopefully thinking about and discussing with your mentor the different options for you and uh, requesting letters of recommendation right now and by the end of November it'd be nice to have your list finalized so that you can finish getting your materials together and go ahead and submit them. So how do I juggle applying to both match and non-match programs? And so the, the unfortunate reality uh, of the situation is that not all postdoc programs uh, participate in the, in the match. So it's very different from internship where um, a vast majority of programs participate in the match, so you don't have to worry about this problem. Uh, at the postdoc level, uh, unfortunately, uh, you have programs that, um, that do choose to participate in the match and those that do not, so there's no consensus on recruiting approaches. Um, and so if you decide to apply to programs that are not in the match, they may be on a very different timeline. Uh, as other programs that are in the match and so you may have to make a decision um, whether to uh, accept a non-match offer uh, and we'll, we'll get back to this but again this is really where it's important for you to have a mentor to give you advice on uh, how to handle this situation given your unique circumstances and, and they're really the, the important thing here is the focus on the fit between the programs you're looking at um, and your training needs and uh, career goals. So the application itself, what sort of materials are typically required for a postdoc application? So this is a, the typical uh, set of materials. There will be some variability from program to program, but I think these are the things that most pro programs uh, require. So uh, the nice thing for those of you that are um, preparing or starting to prepare for the postdoc application process is that you don't have to do the uh, you don't have to do anything like the appy so there's no huge um, 50 page process where you have to count all your hours you're, you're done with that um, so the application process is a little bit uh, simpler at the postdoc level so you need an updated CV you'll need a, a letter of interest or cover letter for each site most programs will ask you for a couple of sample reports that you've that you've been involved with and anywhere from two to three letters of recommendation as well as a grad school transcript and um, this year as you'll see at the bottom of this slide APIC has started a uh, centralized application system um, which is basically an online application portal for postdoc programs. Some neuropsych postdocs uh, may decide to use this, but not all of them are. Uh, many neuropsych postdoc programs will just request that you email all this uh, information to, to them so that you don't have to mail things. But I did want to let you guys aware, know and be aware that there is a, uh, a new postdoc application portal uh, through APIC um, where materials are submitted uh, through this portal similar to what has been done at the internship level for the last few years but it's not universal at this point. So it's just some general tips um, for the application so what about the cover letters so what do you want to put in these things and I, I think um, you want each you want your cover letter to be specific for each program. So you want to say or communicate, what about this program uh, is a good fit for you? Why, why are you a good fit for this program and why is the program a good fit for you? So you want to be specific to each program. Uh, and because of that, you want to proofread. I mean, you're going to have a general cover letter, but you're going to change it for each program. And you want to be very careful that you, you don't have the name of one institution and, and forget to change it at the next letter. So you definitely want to proofread. Get your mentors and uh, your fellow interns to read your letters and, uh, and give you a little bit of feedback uh, about, uh, about uh, how they read. Your CV, you want to make sure it's up to date. At this level, you want to highlight the neuropsych experiences that you've had at the grad school and internship level. And again, have your mentor review your CV to give you some feedback on, uh, on uh, how good it looks.
Sample reports, make sure to de-identify them. And so a lot of postdoc programs are going to ask you to submit a couple of reports that you've been involved with. Um, make sure you take out all um, protected uh, patient information, identifiers, hometowns, um, names of schools, just, you know, when in doubt, you know, take it out if you're not sure if it's a, 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 an identifying piece of information. So really proofread, make sure you have all that information out. Choose diverse populations. So if you're applying to a program that asks for two sample reports, don't submit two 12-year-olds who have a TBI. Try to submit some different populations, different uh, ages or different uh, diagnoses, and make sure that it fits the program that you're targeting. So if you're applying to a postdoc that has a really heavy TBI population, it'd be nice for at least one of your reports to be a TBI, if not maybe both. Um, but if you do two TBI populations, you know, try to have them be different ages or different presenting profiles or try to make them diverse. Similarly, so if, if you're applying to postdoc programs that are in medical settings, um, ideally your sample reports would be medical populations, not ADHD or depression or learning disability. Um, on the other hand, if you're if one of your programs that you're applying to is a, a private practice and they see a lot of neurodevelopmental things like ADHD or autism, then it would be nice to have pro, uh, reports that uh, are for that population. In terms of your letters of recommendation, you're going to have PS to submit two or three. Of course, it helps to have a uh, quote-unquote famous neuropsychologist as a letter writer, but uh, of course that's not always possible and it, it's not a, a deal breaker if you don't have one, but if you have worked with a neuropsychologist that's well known, that definitely helps. You want to have, uh, I, I like to see a um, a letter from your grad school mentor, grad school mentor, your dissertation advisor, even if that person's not a neuropsychologist, um, you know, that's someone that knows you very well and can uh, really speak to your um, ability to uh, uh, to work and, and, and be a good uh, person to work with. Um, it's nice to have uh, a letter from someone that you're working with on internship, even though at this point most of you have only been on internship for a couple of months. Um, it would still be nice to have a, a letter from someone you're currently working with. And give your letter writers um, a brief um, couple of sentences uh, about what you like about each program. That way your letter writers can um, personalize each letter for each program to make them stand out a little bit. So should I contact uh, training directors before applying? It's not necessary. Um, many, many students do that and it's okay if you do. Um, if you do that though and if you've, you know, ask questions before applying, make sure you're asking thoughtful questions, not questions that are covered in the program materials, um, not simple basic questions, but um, if, if you're going to contact a director before applying, uh, have some thoughtful questions that you're asking about. Um, the next question, several sites I applied to for internship sent me emails asking me to apply to their postdoc program. Will they be offended if I don't apply? Uh, they shouldn't be. And if they are offended by that, then they're probably not someone you want to work with anyway, so I wouldn't worry about that. Should I communicate my reasons for not applying to that program? No, you don't have to. You, don't feel ob you should not feel obligated to uh, apply to, uh, to any program, really. All right, so you've submitted your applications, and hopefully you've got a ton of interviews. How does the interview process work? It's very different than internship. Um, uh, an internship, uh, you had to fly all over the place and max out your credit cards. Hopefully, you're not going to have to do that again. Um, for postdocs in neuropsych, many programs um, hold their interviews at uh, the February INS meeting. And this is a tradition that started many years ago. And uh, really, this was done so that uh, uh, interviewees don't have to fly all over the country after one year after having done so for for internship. So many programs hold interviews at INS, but not every program does. And so you will have to check with each individual program uh, to help you with this. Um, many programs that do interview at INS do so on Tuesday 
of the conference week. They do that so that faculty can then attend conference activities that, that start on Wednesday. Some of them though spread them out through the week so you need to be prepared um, if you're going to interview at INS be prepared to get there on Monday and stay most of the week if needed. So this does require you to miss several days of internship and hopefully your um, your internship will be uh, understanding and help you with that process. So, But I would advise you to be there on Monday so that you can hopefully interview, get most of your interviews done on Tuesday. Do I have to register for the INS conference to be able to attend my interviews at INS? Yes. If you're gonna, if you're gonna interview at INS um, INS is very uh, gracious in um, providing and arranging for space for programs to conduct, conduct interviews and they don't charge programs to do that or applicants to do that so um, it, we, we do ask that you um, register for the conference if you're going to use that space and, uh, and interview. Is there a standard response date by which programs are required to contact me to let me know if I've invited for an interview? No, uh, there really isn't, um, unfortunately, a, a agreed upon date. So uh, if you've submitted your materials and you haven't heard back after a reasonable time, it's okay to, to email the program director and ask for your um, the status of your application. That, that's okay. Um, this next question is a very good question, very sensitive question. If I expect to begin a family during postdoc, how could I ask appropriately about whether family leave is offered and or whether there is flexibility in my work schedule to allow for child care? Is this even okay to approach? Um, it's okay for you to ask about this. Um, it is not okay for a program director during an interview to ask you if you're planning on having a baby during fellowship. It's not okay for them to ask you about that. Um, if, if you feel like you're going to be in this situation and if you feel comfortable asking, it's okay. Uh, again, this is another area where if you have a trusted mentor who can help you deal with this, um, that would be a great um, resource for you to have. Also, you could ask for, you could you could get around this by uh, being less direct and just asking, can you tell me about uh, benefits? Um, and if they don't give you a whole lot of information, you could ask for a contact from the Human Resources Department at the institution and, uh, and you can maybe get more information from them about, about benefits. In general though, if you do have a baby on fellowship, which has happened before, um, it, it has happened many, many times, you do need to complete two full years. Some programs may be more flexible than others um, and so um, some programs may ask you to, to you know, do an extra month on the end to make up for any missed time for maternity leave. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, other programs may be more flexible. Are there any questions I would ask that would reduce my chances of getting ranked highly? Um, th there really aren't. Um, you know, as a program director, um, I, I I want interviewees to ask very thoughtful questions and good questions. So don't ask a bunch of basic questions that are easily answered on the program's uh, materials. But it's okay to clarify, to ask for clarification. So you, in, instead of saying something like, what are the rotations that you offer? Most programs are going to have that question answered on their materials. You may say something like, I see that you have a TBI rotation. Can you tell me more about that rotation? Um, so there, there is a way to ask those questions and, and ask for clarification. Should I save sensitive questions for after the match? This really depends on what question um, you're talking about and, and, and what your uh, specific um, circumstances are and so there's really no way to answer that question. This is where you really, again, you need to have a mentor that you can uh, discuss this issue with um, before you get uh, um, to, to get advice on that. So some basic tips. Um, Anst and the SCN EAC do offer an interview workshop at APA. Um, you know, you can uh, that that's definitely something good to attend if possible. Other questions: Should I communicate with programs before or after the interview? You certainly can. Um, it's definitely nice uh, to 
email uh, faculty that you interview with and, and thank them for interviewing you and, and ask any clarifying questions. That's to show that you're interested. That's always a good idea. Um, interview attire. Um, it's business, so uh, you're going to want, want to wear a suit, um, just like um, interviews that you've done in the past. Verbal and nonverbal behavior. Um, this is basic stuff. Smile, maintain good eye contact, ask thoughtful questions. Um, this gets really hard if you're if you're interviewing all day on the Tuesday of INS and let's say you've got eight interviews. By the end of the day you're gonna be really tired. But uh, just remember to continue to smile, uh, continue to show enthusiasm. It's hard for the faculty who are doing the interviews to uh, continue to be enthusiastic after a whole day of interviews. But uh, I think it's important. What materials should I bring with me? <coughs> Excuse me. Do your homework. So have prepared notes for each program during the interview. It's okay to take notes during the interview. Uh, like I said, for most of you, hopefully you'll have a lot of interviews and you may be doing them all on that one day and it's easy to get programs confused so be prepared have notes have specific questions for each program and it's okay to write things down during the interviews what if I have to cancel an interview that's okay you just politely and professionally uh, explain what the conflict is and um, and uh, you know, hopefully they'll they'll understand. Here's some sample interview questions that you might ask, and questions that may be asked of you. Um, so questions that you can ask. This is not a, a an exhaustive list. These are just some examples. What is a typical week like for your postdocs? Uh, what work settings have your former postdocs graduated to? May I speak with your current postdocs? I highly encourage each of you to reach out to current postdocs and, uh, and and speak with them either at INS or via email. If there are any programs out there that try to keep you from doing that, then that's probably a red flag. Uh, they, they should be very open to allowing you to speak with their current uh, postdocs. <coughs> what support is available for attending conferences during postdoc? You can ask that question. Some of the questions that you may be asked, what are you looking for in a postdoc? What are your career goals? Tell me about an interesting or difficult case. Tell me about an ethical dilemma that you have faced and how did you solve that dilemma? Tell me about your dissertation. Here are some very common questions that you may be asked. <coughs> so, the post-interview phase. So. What are the pros and cons of taking a match versus non-match postdoc? And there's no simple answer to this. Uh, it really depends on your individual professional needs and your and your personal circumstances. Um, all programs that participate in the match essentially uh, agree that they um, offer training that is consistent with Houston Conference. But there are many non-match programs out there that are very good and that are very consistent with the Houston Conference and that will prepare you um, for a career. So this is really where you need to consult with your individual mentors when picking out which programs to consider. Especially those of you that may be geographically limited um, is there are certain parts of the country, uh, particularly the, the, the northeastern uh, part of the country and on the west coast that has very many strong non-match programs but also some really good match programs and so you might be in a situation where you've got really good programs some that are not in the match and some that are in the match that you have to consider and so having a mentor that can help you uh, through that situation would be very important. What do I do if I receive a preemptive non-match offer uh, before the match? And so, as I said earlier, programs that participate in the match agree to a timeline, and they agree to a certain set of recruiting rules that they have to follow. Programs that are not in the match don't have to follow those rules. So they may, you may get an offer before you've had time to even interview with match programs. And here you're in a situation where you have to decide, do I accept this offer, uh, which would mean I can't 
interview or consider these other programs that you might really, really like. So you can check the match rules. There are specific rules about how you can respond to a, a, a preemptive offer. And also, again, consult with your mentor. Hopefully you have someone that you trust who understands <coughs> excuse me, how this process works, who can help you through this. So what variables predict my chances of obtaining a match? Um, number of applications. On average, applicants who match submit more rankings than applicants who don't. But you only want to rank programs that you are interested in attending. You don't want to do a shotgun approach where you apply and rank every program that's out there. Only rank a program that you would be um, happy to, to attend if you match there. Geographic limitation, as we've talked about before, this may be a disadvantage for you if, you, if it means that you only have a few programs to rank. Just be aware of that. Lack of clinical hours. There's no real data on this. At the postdoc level, uh, most programs are looking at the quality of your experiences and they're not really counting hours. Um, so I don't think you have to worry about the number of hours necessarily. It's more the quality of, of, of the experiences that you've had. Lack of certain training experiences. Again, there's no data on this for us in terms of uh, does that predict uh, whether or not you match. Uh, but as, as, as you've heard throughout this webinar, if your training is consistent with the Houston Conference guidelines, um, that will be very helpful for you. So what if I don't obtain a postdoc? What are my next steps? Um, there's not really a, um, a second phase of the match like there is with internship, but after the postdoc match, a list of open positions will be released by National Matching Service uh, following the match. And also, there are occasionally positions that open up after the match um, in, in the next few months following the match that uh, sometimes there are positions where they were waiting on budget approval and um, <coughs> they didn't get budget approval prior to the match. And so monitor neuropsych email list um, because oftentimes there are positions that come up uh, in the spring. Thank you very much. We have received just one question so far. Um, I will read the question and invite any of the speakers to answer it. And also for viewers, feel free to submit questions um, and we, we will have 15 more minutes basically to answer them. Um, so the question is, ultimately, I want to be board certified by ABEP. Will doing a postdoc that is accredited by ABN affect my ABEP application? I think as long, this is Do Dr. Bowden again, I, I think um, as long as your postdoc uh, meets Houston Conference guidelines, I, I, I think uh, that's what's more important than whether or not it, it's accredited or, or recognized. Um, as, as Dr. Collins mentioned, if, you, if your program is APA accredited or um, an absent member, it does help uh, fast track a part of the application uh, for, for ABEP, um, but uh, it's not a requirement. Um, so I think the more important thing is, is, is your fellowship consistent with Houston Conference guidelines. Okay, we will wait one more minute to see if we get um, another question.
We would like to thank our speakers for grace, graciously volunteering their time to make this webinar possible, as well as ANS members and other viewers for joining us. We hope you found this information useful and, and would like to kindly ask you to fill out a brief, a brief survey and an anonymous online uh, survey to give us feedback. Your input is very important as it will help us improve future webinars as well as identify relevant topics to better meet your needs as trainees. Finally, this webinar will also be available on YouTube. Thank you.